Okay. Hey guys, um, welcome to another edition of Culture Class Podcast, the podcast where we get to interact with people from different backgrounds and get to learn about other cultures. Uh, first, let me say thank you. Um, I'm recording this a day before People of Culture, but I probably will be posting it the Monday following People of Culture. So I just want to say thank you for those who attended the event. Uh, obviously, <laughs> even though the I haven't. I'm speaking um, into the future now, but I know that you know we had we had a swell event. So thank you for coming. Probably going to be posting uh, bits and pieces of the event, like performances, speeches, the panel discussion, and all that on YouTube and Instagram in the coming months. So just watch out for that. Today's story is not originally mine. Uh, let me just put that out there. I did get permission to share the story though. So a young man in Kenya called Justice Nandwa, uh, he has this YouTube page and this media organization and this platform called Shared Moments with Justice. And uh, today's story is actually a video. I'm just posting the audio version of this. So I got, I DM'd him and say, hey, you know, would it be okay for me to post the audio version of this on my podcast? And he said, yeah, no problem. So I appreciate you for that justice. And the story is about a young Kenyan woman called Mercy, Mercy Attis. Uh, she's from Kenya. And, you know, it's a very moving story. If you go to the YouTube uh, video, I think he has about, you know, 300,000 views in the past month since it was published. And, you know, she lost her mom and brother you know, in quick succession in the span of, you know, a few weeks or a few months. And, you know, she found her way to America one way or the other, you know, thinking America was the land of milk and honey. And yes, I agree that America does provide, you know, a lot of opportunities that other emerging countries or do not necessarily provide, but America is not necessarily the end all be all. And her story, I really resonated with it because she came here for school originally. She eventually had to drop out of school because uh, she could not afford her tuition. And, you know, she eventually got into like some form of prostitution. You know, she was forced into it and she caught an arson charge. Um, she caught an arson charge because two of her co-workers or two two people she knew were making fun of her dead father and you know she got angry and she she lit up uh, an area and you know she got an arson charge so she went to prison and ultimately she was deported but even through all that she didn't necessarily give up like she was still pushing when she went back to Kenya she like opened she sold you know fruits and stuff on the street is trying to launch a singing career. You know, she had like a small restaurant and it's just an amazing story. Like I'll allow you guys to listen to this, but again, let me say thank you to Justice Nandwa from uh, Shared Moments with Justice. And this story is about a young Kenyan woman called Mercy Attis, who had an impression of America, came here. It didn't work out for her. She was deported and she's trying to find her way back. And like the title says, I suffered enough in America. Enjoy. So there are some people who still believe right now in 2021 that uh, going to the U.S. is the best thing that can ever happen to their lives. And they just think that if you go to the U.S., then you're definitely going to be, you know, somebody big and there will be no more sorrows, no more worries, no more struggles, no more suffering, no more pain. Like, it's the land of opportunity flowing with milk and honey. And um, I'm not trying to discourage you by any means. I just want to tell you that uh, when you first arrive in the U.S., there is that excitement. And then reality very quickly sets in. <laughs> For me, I, uh, when I was on the aeroplane, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to bring all my family to America and um, I will never come back to Kenya. I, I honestly thought I would never ever come back to Kenya. And 
I will never uh, border my tattoo again. I will never get on a motorbike and I'm going to have drive a big car. I'm going to get married to a white man. And the very first culture shock happens in the aeroplane, right in the aeroplane, even before I arrive, because everything they're serving me with, I've never seen it. I was in uh, Fly Emirates with uh, it's a, an Arabian airline. And the first culture shock is like, um, what is this? I've never seen it before. And so I just had to travel hungry the whole time. So hunger is the very first culture shock. I was served, I don't even remember what it was, but there was nothing that I was familiar with at all. Okay, so a little background into myself and a little story of how I ended up even going to the US. This was always a dream uh, and it was a dream of my father. You know, I've never said before that my father was a polygamous man and he had two wives and, uh, you know, they lived in one home and there was a lot of, uh, you know, just one man with two wives living in one home. There was a lot of jealousy, uh, a lot of back and forth and my, uh, my mom was the second wife. And the first wife always mocked my mom, saying, all your kids are going to America, all your kids are going to America. And my kids are just uh, staying in Kenya, my kids are paying their school fees. So uh, I used to say when I was a little child that I will be the first one to go to America. How come she's telling my mom that uh, all my siblings are going to America and none of my siblings has ever gone to America? So from a very young child, I used to say whenever uh, my mom was insulted, I would be like, okay. This is America, I'm, I'm the first one who will go there. Right, so those childhood fantasies, yeah, there was uh, already something that I was looking forward to. And I, I knew that uh, in America, there is no more suffering. Maybe there's no death, there's no sorrow. <laughs> Everything is perfect, like it's heaven, you know? That's what I thought. During high school, something happened, like my mom died when I was in high school in Form 3. And when my mom died, my, my world turned upside down. And I remember going to the funeral and crying so hard and saying, uh, I'm left with nobody who cares. Because growing up with my mom, you know, in, in Luo culture, they have so many beliefs, especially in Alego, where I come from. They have so many beliefs about witchcraft and all that thing. So uh, when my mom died, I just felt like my whole world had come to an end. So I left the village and uh, after burying my mom, in fact, I was just rushed. I went the day before burial and after burial, I was taken back to school. I didn't even have time to mourn or to grieve for my mom. So I was taken back to high school in Form 3. I was doing exams for index numbers. And when I finished high school, my brother was like, you can't go back to that village, you know. Lego people, they are full of witchcraft. We don't want anything to happen to you. And at that time, he was a student at University of Eastern Africa, Baraton. So he said, you have to come and stay with me, live with me in Baraton University. He was also a student, you know, just struggling. Baraton school fees is very, very high. And uh, he just wanted to take me under his wings and protect me. So I was really happy to go stay with my brother. I was really, really happy to go to Baraton University, not as a student, but to stay with him. And just one day he said he, ha he has a headache. And he was taken to the hospital inside the university. And then they referred him to Moiri Farol in Endoret. And uh, this was just two months after I finished high school. And at Moiri Farol, I remember I spoke with him on a Saturday night and he was fine. And Sunday morning he was dead. Yeah, something also that is very uh, tricky because the last people who saw him before his death were my step family. And my step family works in that hospital, you know, as a nurse. So there are also some unanswered questions about my brother's death. And after he died very suddenly, I remember even the day of his. Uh, burial there was a fight in my home in my village the day that my brother yeah so i didn't go i i went home last when my brother died i remember as they were bringing my brother's body home uh my older sister started crying and was like you you said he will come back with a red flag okay the red flag is here are you happy 
and I remember my step family attacking my family and then the the university students just jumping in and there was like a big physical fight on the day that my brother's body was brought home and so after my brother's burial uh, my family was like you can't go to Baraton because if you go to Baraton you are going to die too the people who killed your brother you know the people who killed my brother they are going to kill me too because my brother was so young what was amazing was you know the love you would think on his funeral that they were burying a prime minister or something because people came from Nairobi from Kisumu from all over from say like from all over the country and the students also came like in large numbers and um, it was amazing because he was just 23 you know and already so much love I always wonder what would have happened if he was still alive I always wonder because he was the one who was like really strong so after my brother's death, I saw no future. I thought uh, it was the end, you know. When my mom died, I thought it was the end of life. But I remember at my mom's funeral, my brother said, uh, you're a Christian, you should not lose hope. You know, you are going to see your mother again. There will be a resur resurrection. And my brother was starting to be a pastor. And it's the same brother who is now dying, the one who was giving me hope and encouragement. So I'm like, what is the need of even believing in God? Because how can God take my mother and then take my brother? you know, within a very short period of time, less than two years apart. And so I'm thinking there's no hope. <laughs> so eventually I go to, I, go, I got a call from Baraton University. There was a lecturer there, also a white lecturer, actually African-American named Dr. Jordan. And he had talked with the school administration. So Dr. Jordan was uh, my brother's employer. My brother used to weed flowers for, for her. And so he talked to the vice chancellor, who then was Professor Mutuku Mutinga. By the way, wherever he is, he was a really good vice chancellor for Baraton University, and he used to help a lot of students. So uh, through some whatever they did, I was able to be enrolled at the university. And the, during the time I was enrolled, uh, my brother's friend, named Peter Kosge, got uh, to go to the United States. I don't know how he went. But uh, Peter Kosge was also a theology student at Baraton. And when he went, he started to write me an email. He used to communicate with me through his wife first. And he said, Master, I want to help you. I want you to come to America. And I was like, yeah, you know, America was already on my dream since childhood. So I was like, please, just bring me to America, even if I have to come and work as a maid. And he would be like, no, 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 God did not create you to be a maid. God has something better for you. And I didn't believe him. I was like, he doesn't understand. I just want out of Kenya. I just want out of all, all the struggles at home. I want, I want out and I want to get all my family out. So eventually he sent me some application forms and, uh, and uh, I applied and I sent the applications and one day they just called me and said, uh, you have a letter. And I, it was the best letter I ever read that I had a full scholarship to study in the U.S. My joy was beyond me. Just a Brock student, you know, in Baraton they have borders and they scholars. So I remember just being really, 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 really happy. So I just started my course at Baraton University. And here I am getting an opportunity to go to America on a full scholarship. So uh, you can imagine how uh, happy I was. But I didn't even have bus fare to go to Nairobi from Eldoret. I eventually uh, asked for some fare. I went to Nairobi. And in Nairobi, I'm looking for a passport. I'm looking for a way to go to the interview. I'm just uh, looking for what to do with my admission. Later, I have been admitted. But now, what next? So I was knocking and knocking and asking. And some people were like, I can't help you but go to this office. And this office would be like, I can't help you but go to this office. You can imagine I walked around so many government offices in Nairobi. Eventually, somebody directed me to go to the immigration office. So I went to the immigration office in Nairobi. And I met there a guy named Isaiah Otieno. And Isaiah talked with his boss. His boss then was the Minister of Foreign Affairs. I believe that's correct, yeah. And so when when he had me, so I just told him I got a scholarship to go to America, but I don't have a passport, I don't have a visa, I don't know what to do. 
and I told him briefly my history. My mom died. My dad was alive but very old. And you know, my mom was the second wife of my dad. So my, my dad is alive but he's very old and retired and he has no money. And I just need help. And I remember that he just held my hands. It was like a miracle. He took me to Nyayo house. I don't know, maybe at that time it wasn't even Nyayo house. But he took me to the passport office. They took my photos and he told me to come tomorrow. The next day when I went, they had my passport. I didn't pay a dime for my passport. So now they were trying to book for me an appointment because there was a very short time where I was supposed to report. And all the appointments were booked at the American Embassy. So Isaiah Teno held my hand and took me to the American Embassy. Then it was in, still in Gigiri, I believe still the same location. So I just hear, Marcelino uh, Nyango, Window 6, is the African-American lady. And I'm like, damn, <laughs> I'm not getting a visa. And then I just composed myself and I said, hi, madam. <laughs> you can remember, you can imagine me. I was really young and I just had like uh, braids. I don't know how they call them. Uh, just straight lines, you know, no, no extensions, no extensions. Just lines going to the back. I was really, I still remember that, how I looked. I said, hi, how are you today? And she was like, <laughs> taken aback because nobody says hi to her and she says I'm fine thank you just a moment I'll be right with you I'll be like no problem at all and so she started asking me why are you late for school I told her it's because uh, uh, admission letter arrived late but I've come uh, during my earliest convenience so she said okay she asked me a few questions uh, why should I give you a visa and not everybody here because there are so many people who want to go to America and I said, you should give me a visa because I have a spirit that never gives up. My mom died when I was in high school and I could have easily dropped out of school. But I went home, I buried my mom, and I went back and I finished high school. And the same way, even if it will not be easy in America, I promise you that I will never give up. And she said, congratulations, you have been, you have been approved to get to the of America. And I remember just, ah! just jumping up and down. So then uh, I started running and she said, come back and uh, pick up your visa tomorrow. <laughs> yes, now after I got the visa, the trip was real now. Now I was going to America and now I was, uh, just didn't have the ticket, the air ticket. And uh, I went to HELB, Higher Education Loans Board. Yeah, I know many people owe HELB. <laughs> and asked them to give me a loan for my ticket, but they said they don't give loan to international students. So they referred me to a really great woman named Alisa Yonga, and she's the one who uh, talked with her husband, who is a pastor, and uh, the husband took me to their church and they raised money for my ticket. And once again, I just want to say thank you so much. May God continue to bless you and lift you up. I know they have helped many, many people, not just me. So um, the very first impression when I get to the airport, and just not to mention that every single person who helped me was not from my tribe, you know. So it's really important that when you're meeting somebody, uh, you don't look at their tribe, you don't look at their color, you don't look at whatever. If you, if you are in, in a position to help somebody, just help them, you know. But the very, very first time before we landed in the aeroplane, there was a guy who made an announcement in the aeroplane. And you would think that uh, we are entering heaven the way he made this announcement. And you would think this is all he has ever done in his whole life because it was so professional. It was like, welcome to the United States of America. Ladies and gentlemen, I was like, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> I was in the United States of America. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. The plane is now landing in Houston, Texas. And da 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 it's so good. I felt so high, like I'm on drugs, you know. <laughs> so we land at the first airport in Houston, Texas, and they're holding me again. They tell me to sit down somewhere and wait. And they're saying, how come uh, your visa is reading you're going to Silver Spring, Maryland, but you are in Arkansas? You have to sit there. So they sat me there until my, my last plane left me. I was supposed to land finally in Little Rock, Arkansas. But the plane from Houston to Little Rock 
left me because I was being held. And I was held there for hours. When I was arriving, I was not in communication with anybody in America because we didn't have phones at that time. Okay, some rich people had phones, but I didn't have a phone. And uh, I was not in communication. I didn't know how to answer. I just told them, uh, Arkansas is a branch. Maryland is the main campus, but Arkansas is a branch of the university, which is just something that came out of my head. And I think it worked. So eventually I'm landing in Arkansas and it's summertime. I remember it was on May 25th. And I'm landing in Arkansas. And honestly, the first shock that I've said a million times is the dressing. Everybody's wearing shorts. The old, <laughs> the ugly, the beautiful, the young. Everybody's wearing like really, really small shorts, jeans shorts. And just little tank tops and I'm like oh my god these people are walking naked I can't believe these people are walking naked and you know I was wearing a very long dress I landed I don't know what to do I'm running around the airport and I want to buy a drink because I'm hungry remember I have not eaten anything since I left Kenya because I didn't know how it's, I, I, I'm not going to eat something I don't know what if I'm eating a snack <laughs> so I was really hungry and when I asked for the price of a soda because I saw soda at least I've seen soda in Kenya so I asked, how much is this Coca-Cola? And they said five dollars. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm translating it into Kenyan money, like 500 shillings. And in Kenya, so that is 30 shillings. And I'm like, oh my God, these people are thieves. They want to rob me right here at the airport. I can't believe a soda is five dollars. So I said, I'm never going to buy anything in America. I'm never, ever, 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 ever. So if you are going to America for the first time, the prices of everything will also shock you. So I'm just sitting somewhere and then this African-American lady comes and she's like, hi, sweetheart. How are you, honey? Where are you from? And I said, I'm from Kenya. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, you're from Africa. You're from the motherland. Come here, she's hugging me tight. She's embracing me. She's shaking with me. She's jumping and I'm like, what? And she said, what do you want to eat? I want to buy for you something. And I said, please, please don't buy for me anything. You can imagine how heavy my accent was. It's too expensive. Don't buy for me anything at all. <laughs> she said, it's okay. I can afford it. I can buy for you. I don't know. Whatever. She forced me eventually. And I had to wait in the airport almost another eight hours for me to be picked up. It was a really long wait uh, because from the airport to the school was four hours drive. So this person had just driven four hours and now they have to drive another four hours. And it seems like they left the airport just before my, I, fl I flew in. I got in the van and we started driving to the school. So we are driving, driving. I'm like, oh my God, where are we going to? We are leaving the Tamak Road. We are getting in the Maram Road in the U.S. And I'm like, um, I thought the Maram Road is in my village in Kabura. How are we get getting... <laughs> I had imagined America is like, <laughs> I really believed America is heaven. So we got in the Maram Road and eventually after many four hours, like four hours, we are in the school. And when you get there, it's nighttime, which is daytime in Kenya. So uh, the next day again, it's a strictly vegetarian diet. There is no meat. There is no, uh, imagine, no eggs, no milk. We were just eating soy products. Uh, we would be served granola cereal with some soy milk. Really, the culture shock for food was huge on me because I would just go look at the table and turn around and start crying because I was not familiar with anything, maybe except for the fruits. Just a few days later, they said, let's get on the van. We are going to Wichita, Kansas. So I'm like, this sounds exciting. Wichita, Kansas sounds good, better than Arkansas. <laughs> So we're going to Wichita, Kansas, and they're telling us you have to go and sell books there. The one who is giving us the instructions where to go is this guy named Eugene Prewitt. I believe maybe he was the founder of Wichita Hills College. The place where I was is Wichita Hills College. So in Wichita, Kansas, uh, when I went to church on Saturday that week, I met some Kenyans. Uh, there was a lady named Rosalind who is a nurse, a little lady and other Kenyans that I met. And they're the first people who took me to uh, a buffet. <laughs> so that's the day that I knew, oh, 
So there's meat in America, there's chicken in America, there's milk in America, there's ice cream in America, there's all these things. So during the week, uh, we would wake up in the morning, have our prayers inside the church. We lived inside the church. We would wake up, we would have our prayers, and then uh, we had bags, everybody have a heavy bag. And we get on the van, and then they go drop you in in an estate. And then you have to start knocking door to door to door to door. And everybody have a memorized script. So uh, we would go like this. Hi, my name is Marcy. I'm a student working my way through school. Instead of junk food or magazines, we decided to offer something more lasting. Desire of Ages talks about the life of Jesus from the time he was born to the time he died. It talks about his ministry here on earth and how he healed the sick, how he raised the dead, how he made the blind to see, and how... And then we go to the uh, next book. Choices offers the latest information in healthy cooking. They are food that you can prepare in 30 minutes or less. So it's a long strict script. And sometimes I would uh, like recite my whole script and then the guy, the, the customer would be like, excuse me, what did you just say? After taking like five minutes, <laughs> because my accent was really, really, really heavy. And another challenge I faced was the dogs. You know, those uh, white people, the dogs are like human beings. And I was so scared of dogs. So when I, oh, 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 I would just be like, oh my God, <laughs> today I'm dead. <laughs> I was so scared of their dogs. But their dogs, you have to like pet them. So if you're going to America, you have to pet them and talk to them like a human being and be like, hi, cutie, what's your name? And touch them everywhere. So I had to learn to be friendly with the dogs. And then I had to learn to uh, speak with their accent. So they would train me. They would put me aside. You don't, you don't say what? I say water. Okay. My name is Mercy, not Mercy. <laughs> So I had to really learn to uh, speak. So I sold books the whole time at summertime. Some people would be like, no, I'm sorry, I don't want your book, but I'll give you here a $20 donation. And if you gave the Eugene Prairie $20 donation, he would not give you anything. So if I get, got a donation, I would just pocket it, <laughs> send it home or something like that. <laughs> By the way, one day I got a chance to call Kenya, you know? I think it's the first time I was calling Kenya from America since I had arrived. So this woman, this white woman, she gave me her phone. She said, okay, you want to talk to your family? It was on a Saturday, yeah, after church. Yes, yes, I want to talk to my family. Here's the phone. And she said, you can talk as long as you want. So I started calling my sister. I talk with my sister. <laughs> Say like one hour. I call my brother. I talk with my brother. I call somebody. I talk with somebody. Wait, wait until the phone bill came. When the phone bill came, this white woman came there. This African girl, she used to be fine. The phone bill is over $500. I don't remember exactly how much it was, but it was a lot of money. <laughs> I said, but she gave me the phone. She told me to just call for as long as I like. Oh, my goodness. It was so high. For, I, I kept selling books door to door for many months, say the whole summertime. I arrived in May, so we sold books all the way until September the end of summer. So um, one day I had a really, really huge breakdown when I was selling books. And this was because uh, one of the guys, I think the guy from Mexico said, I smell. And I really, really, really cried. Like it affected me so much. I cried, I went, like I wanted to kill myself. I was like, just take me back to Kenya. Please, please, please. Like I was so embarrassed, I cried so hard. And uh, one, one of the ladies who was selling books door to door with us, her dad was a doctor, yeah? So she called her dad and she said, uh, you know, this, this lady from Kenya, uh, you know, somebody said that she smells. And the dad said, okay, it's the change in, if it is true, it could be the change in food, the food you're not used to, it could be the change in climate, it could be the change in uh, so many things, but it's, it's almost normal. If you're coming from a whole different continent to a whole different continent with different climate and all that thing. And 
that is one of the days that I really, really wanted out. I really wanted to come back to Africa, despite the witchcraft, whatever. I wanted <laughs> home. Anyway, the ladies really helped me. The lady that the dad was a doctor, she helped me. She bought me deodorant. And okay, after summer, we went back to the school. The school in quotes. Let me just say in plain and simple language that I was scammed. I was lied to. I was misled. I was taken an advantage of. Let me just say plain and clear like I've never said before that Eugene Prewitt was using uh, poor people from third world countries for his own interest. Saying that you're selling books to go to school but actually you're selling books for his own profit. Because he would take the money and he would never even pay us anything. There was no salary. They just said the money will be used for school fees. I don't understand this program. I believe that eventually the immigration did shut it down for international students. But uh, we never lived there in the school. We just always lived inside the churches. We slept in the sleeping bags. He never gave us uh, lunch. During the lunchtime, he would take his wife, Heidi, <laughs> I remember all their names, and they would go eat somewhere, you know, very fancy and leave us hungry. I remember that I just used to eat, uh, I used to cook white rice every morning. So that is what I ate, white rice for lunch for almost a year. <laughs> Plain white rice with nothing, no soup, nothing. So this guy Eugene Prewitt was just using us. One day I met a missionary lady. I tried to sell books to her at the Baptist church and the lady said, uh, you don't look okay, you have to tell me what is wrong. First, she was really shocked. What am I doing in Arkansas of all the places in America? What is an African immigrant doing in Arkansas? Because Arkansas is like for really white racists. <laughs> and then Arkansas, you know, many African students, they, don't, they go to Texas, they go to New Jersey, they go to Minnesota, they go to California, whatever. Nobody comes to Arkansas. So as much as I tried to tell her I'm okay, I'm okay, she insisted that you have to tell me you are not okay. So she's the one who stole me from Wachita Hills, from the church, and she took me to live in her house. And I stayed with her for a while, uh, until one day uh, she kicked me out. <laughs> so this lady, the missionary lady, she used to go to work and her husband used to go to work. I used to go to school. So they used to give me their computer, chat freely. In their computer, I believe that sometimes maybe I used to visit dating sites, you know, because I had gotten this notion that if you marry an American, you get a green card. Yes. And if you get a green card, then uh, you become a citizen. I believe I was, even if I wasn't, I've never really understood, but I remember that pornography popped up in the computer. So I don't know if it popped up because of the website I was visiting or if it popped up because somebody else used to watch pornography on this computer. Because to me, coming from Kabura village, honestly, we had no computers. And honestly, I had never even seen or imagined that pornography exists. I had never seen it. And when it popped up, just like I was a teenager, it was very normal for me to click and see what, you know, out of curiosity. I clicked on it. I'm not going to lie. I clicked on the pornography and when I clicked on it, I was amazed, like, uh, <laughs> the only thing that happened is that when I clicked on the pornography, many windows started popping up. So when I clicked on this, this was popping up and this was popping up and this was popping up and, and so the whole computer got infected with the pornogra pornography virus. So when I tried to close it, more were popping up. When I tried to close it, there was even more and more and more and more and more until the whole computer was just pornography here and here, like one million windows. So <laughs> I tried to turn the computer off, you know, I tried to restart it. I tried to do everything, but the more I opened, the more they got even, even more and more and more and more and more. So when they came back, I had turned the computer off. When they turned the computer on, it was just pornography, 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 pornography everywhere. And they were like, is this what you are doing here? And I said, I'm sorry, but I didn't open. Yes, you did. Yes, you opened it. And I said, it just popped up. I never, yes, you have seen it. This is what you are doing here. 
So they just kicked me out on the streets to nowhere. Yeah, so at this time I had lost my relationship with the Eugene Prewitt who brought me to America. Uh, the Peter Cos Gay, the, the Kalenjin pastor who had brought me here, was living in another state. He was living in Minnesota. And he only called me the first day when I arrived in the, in the U.S. And then he had never called me again because I had no phone anyway. So I have I've lost three relationships. I don't have a, any relationship with Cos Gay. I don't have a relationship with the... Eugene Prewitt, and I don't have a relationship with uh, the missionary people who had adopted me now. Uh, they had actually raised money for me to register at Northwest Arkansas Community College. So I'm in school, but you know in Arkansas there are no buses, there are no trains. It's just like a village. And the school is very far away. So I can't even get to school. So I go out here on the streets on my own. And I'm a lady, I'm very young and uh, I'm black in a white country, <laughs> in a white state. Eventually I got another, I met another Kenyan lady. And this Kenyan lady said, uh, you're from Kenya, come stay with me, you know. And when I went to stay with her, she was now actually practicing what I had seen. She would bring different men to her house and have sex with them in front of me. And I was still a virgin. <laughs> <laughs> so life was changing very very fast and very quickly after that I got a boyfriend too I got a white boyfriend <laughs> so let's go hand in hand if you are bringing men to, to your house I'm going to his house too he was actually her neighbor this guy's name is Gareth yeah Gareth played a very important role in of my life in America because Gareth would uh, he's the one who introduced me to American food like McDonald's how to eat burgers and French fries, and he, he, he taught me about their holidays, Thanksgiving, and, uh, and their culture, and he was not a bad guy, he was actually a really nice guy. He took, he took me to his mom's house, and I would meet his dog, their dogs, I would get used now to the pets that I was scared of, and uh, later I just decided to relocate. Actually, before I relocated, another woman adopted me again. <laughs> Peggy. Peggy found me walking on the snow to the college and she gave me a ride and she said she told me they don't have kids, her and her husband and they want me to stay in their house. And so I stayed with Peggy and this is also a cultural difference that happened between me and Peggy. You know in Africa if you're working you have to take care of your family. If your mom is alive, your parents are alive and in the US you only take care of yourself and your family. So Peggy would not understand why I want to pay school fees for my younger sister. She would not understand. She just thought I would be their child and they would love me and provide for me if I want anything, if I want. They just would give me, they would buy for me, not give me money, but they would buy for me anything that I wanted. But I had no money to help my family. So I also left Peggy's house and I moved now to Dallas, Texas. I dropped out of school because the international tuition. Okay, one thing, if you are trying to go to study in America and you are coming from Kenya or any other African country is that in America, if you are an uh, international student, you have to pay like three times what an American citizen pays. The tuition is three times. So if they're paying $10,000 per semester, you have to pay almost $30,000 per semester. And then you don't qualify for their programs. The programs are either you are a U.S. citizen or you're a permanent resident. They have like scholarship, they have uh, many grants, they have, but you have to be an American citizen to qualify. So me as a student visa holder, I didn't qualify. And I started working in a nursing home. Nursing home is where you deal with old people. Uh, you have to clean their, change their diapers and brush their teeth. Pupu, yawaze, yes, yes. And it's crazy because many, many Kenyans do that job. Not just Kenyans, but many Africans. Because the people there, they don't want to do it. Um, I wouldn't say it's humiliating because it pays, you know. But <clears throat> for me as a woman, the challenge I, I faced is lifting the heavy people. You know, sometimes I have to lift a man who is three times my weight. 
Although they train you how to lift it, but eventually you start feeling pain in your back. And uh, there's also a lot of racism and discrimination in the nursing department. Uh, I did not know that I was black until I went to America. I actually just thought I'm a human being. <laughs> But I had to, to meet the hard reality of somebody in the nursing home calling, leave me alone, nigga. Don't touch me, nigga. And I'm like, what is nigga? <laughs> I'm trying to help. Don't touch me, nigga. And it's even in the churches. Because one day I tried to sing inside the church and they said, sit down and shut up, nigga. A white person telling you that. I'm like, what is this nigga they're calling me? <laughs> what is this nigga? Mm. But I later came to realize it's a very, very discriminatory. It's the worst you can call somebody. But uh, I think there's a misunderstanding. Because when I went to America, I was told African Americans are very lazy people. They don't want to work. They don't want to do this. But it's just that when they try to work, when you try to rebuild your life, somebody's killing you, somebody's discriminating against you, somebody's treating you like you're less than a human being. So it's very complicated. I want to advise you that before you judge an African American, try to find out why. First, try to find out why. And uh, there were many, many people, many Kenyans living in Texas. I didn't stay in Texas for too long because I had something pushing me. <laughs> I had something pushing me to be bigger and greater. And um, the love that Kenyans are supposed to have in a foreign country is not as strong as the one from Nigerians. You know, Nigerians, when they go to America, they really hold each other's hands. And I just wish somebody would have held my hand. You know, somebody would have known that I'm just here alone. I don't have family in America. I just wish somebody from All Nations SDA Church, you know, would have, would have, would have shown me the way. This is what you're supposed to do. This is how you're supposed to get permanent resident. You're supposed to do this. I don't move from state to state. You know, I really wish that uh, the love between Kenyans would be stronger, that we would be more united and... And, and we would help the newcomers. So uh, one of the biggest mistakes that I made as a young person was moving from one state to another, to another, to another. Um, if you are in America, it's better that you stay in one place and you hang on to one job. Like I had the nursing home job, I would have just hang on to that job. But as a young person, I was chasing for some even bigger dreams. Yes, it's uh, okay to dream, but um, that's one mistake that I made. I was also getting a lot of influence on uh, now putting really, really, we've seen people with really, really, really long nails that reach here. <laughs> now I was getting Americanized. <laughs> and when I was putting really, really long nails like this, I was giving a message that I'm a prostitute, you know, when I'm not. And I was inviting men to come and take advantage of me. So uh, uh, I, I, I should have remained simple. And I want to advise you, you know, if you are coming from the village, I don't say remain a village girl, but don't get so influenced so fast, you know. My ears were not even pierced. Wearing earrings, I want to, to now wear earrings. And I want to, to, uh, to be fake. I want fake hair because people have fake hair. I want uh, fake nails and fake, fake everything. That just invited those for men to take advantage of me. To, for men to take advantage of me and to use me and to dump me. I'm thinking, okay, I've met you know, a boyfriend. You know, if you're raised in the village, you're you are raised that you meet one man and you get married and that's your husband. And that's it. And so I'm meeting maybe a guy. Maybe I'm thinking, oh, this is a Kenyan guy. In fact, there was a Kenyan guy that I met. And I really thought also, after, the, after Gareth, he's really serious and he wants marriage. But no, just a week later he was with another white woman. So those are things that would really break my heart. Because I was um, thinking, okay, I want to get married, I want to settle, but no, they're not thinking like that. For, out of this desperation, I was looking for something I couldn't find. I thought I was looking for Kenyans, but when I found Kenyans, they didn't welcome me. So um, I had to go look for something else. I, I was maybe, 
I, I, I wasn't finding something that I was looking for. So I moved again from Dallas to New Jersey after a very short time. And I'm moving to New Jersey to pursue my dreams. And I lived in New Jersey with another lady from also Kenya, Kalenjin lady. And uh, she was nice. She was nice. And I would go to New York to do modeling. But then again, she, she recently called me, by the way. And she said she, she feels like she, did, she, wasn't, uh, she didn't give me the best that she could have in my situation. At this moment, I've been in America just less than two years, and I've already moved all these states. <laughs> in fact, my visa is not even expired yet. When I, when I left uh, North Brunswick, New Jersey, and I relocated to California, that is when everything fell apart. I was living to California because I knew I want to be a star. I want to be an actress, I want to be in the big movies, I want to be uh, singing. My first arrival at Hollywood was shock because I thought I would see all the stars, you know, the Beyonce walking and... Lupita <laughs> Nyong'o. I just thought, you know, you would see many stars, Brad Pitt. But it wasn't like that. You just see some stars drawn on the ground. <laughs> So I actually went to an acting class. I now stopped working in the nursing home because I was now like, I want to be a star. I worked in the nursing home for a while. I was now doing home health care where I would go and live with a patient in their house and help them with everything that they need. And uh, I met some guy online and he told me I'm very beautiful and I can make a lot of money. And I said, how? And he said, uh, I can do strip dancing. So um, I said, I can never, ever, ever do that. You know, I still had the SD in me. Never, ever, ever I do that. And I swore I would never do that, no matter what. But after some time, when I ended up homeless, I saw a magazine and I went to a strip club and I started strip dancing. Strip dancing was uh, paying well. I would make like 40,000 Kenya shillings in a day. But then uh, it came with its price also. Because after I stripped, I would have so many guys talking me. Like even <laughs> when I left the strip club, I would have guys. They, they had a policy of no sex in the strip club. Uh, they had surveillance cameras everywhere. So we would just strip, yeah? And I remember then somebody came and told me, no, you can't make uh, money stripping in Hollywood. You need to go uh, strip in Las Vegas, Las Vegas, Nevada. That's, that's where you will get paid. Like $400 is nothing. So there's always this thing that you're getting money, but you're not satisfied with it. You can make even $5,000 per day in Las Vegas. So I left uh, Los Angeles one day with my friend. <laughs> from the island and we went to Las Vegas. As soon as we arrived in Las Vegas, there were some guys with a limousine, yeah? Free limo ride to the strip club, free limo ride. I was like, oh my God, my dreams are coming true. <laughs> so I got in the limo. I'd never gotten in a limousine inside in my whole life. So I got in the limo and really they took us to the strip club. As they were taking us, this guy was telling me, this guy was an African born in Europe. And he was telling me, you know, you can make a lot of money. You know, <laughs> it was always the chase for money. You can make a lot of money. And uh, I have a lot of clients who come to the casinos in Las Vegas. And they are looking for black girls. You know, in America, it's very hard to find real black girls. The African-Americans, they are very light, almost white. Then there's the Hispanic. There's, he was telling me, you know, uh, people are tired of white, white girls. There are some people who come specifically and they want a real black girl. So I can introduce you. And she, he was saying, these people, they even pay you 5000 per shot. Like to have sex with you. $5,000. 500000 to have sex with, with you. I was like, yeah, sure, I'm in. <laughs> you know? So I remember that I went to his house. Uh, this guy's name was, uh, 
His friend name was Richie and his name is disappearing. But I went to his house and when I went to his house in Las Vegas, he um, he had a lot of clothes for women. He was a pimp. You know, a pimp is somebody who sells women. And um, he told me, okay, so I'm going to introduce you to this business because there's uh, prostitution and there's high-end prostitution. I'm going to introduce you to very high-end prostitution. So I said, okay, me, I'm ready. And uh, he gave me clothes, very beautiful clothes. He took me to the salon. He did my hair. He said he did my hair in a simple ponytail. And he gave me some perfumes from Victoria's Secret. And he dressed me. He said, high-end prostitutes, they don't dress shaggy. They, they dress like... Uh, uh, normal people and he told me you have to be very familiar with everything on the news so that when a client wants to talk about politics about celebrities about sports about everything you have to read and you have to be very smart so i remember that the whole day this guy was taking me around las vegas and he was just las vegas by the way is beautiful it's beautiful <laughs> he was taking me to very high-end clubs and he's saying when you get here in this club what you have to do is just uh, you sit and you smile and because you don't drink, you just uh, can order some water and put it in a glass and pretend that you are drinking. So it was now time to go put uh, action into practice. And he told me to wait for him at Paris Hotel in Las Vegas. So there was live music playing and he tried to call me, but I didn't hear the phone ringing. He came and he was like, when I call you, you have to be very alert. So this is my first day for high-end prostitution. First day at work. <laughs> So on the first day at work, he called again, yeah, I picked up the fall. When I picked up the fall, there were two white guys from Chicago. And the first thing they said, wow, you smell very good. Oh my God, you smell so good. That's the, the client's first comment. And I'm like, thank you. Oh my God, and I love your accent. Where are you from? And I'm, I'm from Kenya. <gasps> That's beautiful. Wow, we wanted a black girl, we can have some fun. It turned out that uh, these guys were smoking a lot of cigarettes. We went to their hotel, by the way. They were smoking so many cigarettes that I, I was uncomfortable. They were asking me, what is your price? I said, $5,000. Uh, they laughed at me. They were like, who's going to pay you $5,000? <laughs> and uh, as we were still talking, the pimp was calling again. Hello, where are you? There's another car client. You're supposed to go inside, have sex, get your money, get out. There's no time for discussion. There's no time for nothing. Yeah? And you know I'm a village girl. How am I going to go? And they wanted me to have sex with them, two guys. Yeah? Two guys at the same time. I said, that's something I cannot do. <laughs> so when, uh, uh, what is his name? Is Ray or what? These guys, when they had the pimples calling, they were scared. They said, you have to go right now. You know, we didn't even have sex. They said, you have to go right now because these pimp people, they are bad. They can kill, they can shoot and kill us right now. So I went back to the pimples. Where is the money? There's no money. You can't be serious. Huh? You didn't even turn out that trick. It's called turning a trick when you manage to nini. Okay, so the second time, he called me, called me. I didn't pick up. He said, okay, you have to go home and rest. We'll bring you back tomorrow. But the next morning, his friend Richie came and started insulting me. He was like, you have to go now. You have to get out of my friend's house. You can't even turn a trick. What is wrong with you? Huh? You're useless. You're not helping us with anything. And it was just the second day. I stayed with this guy one day until he wanted to rape me. So he, he concluded that I, I cannot be a prostitute. So he wanted me now for himself. And I said no again. And he said, I'm very, very unfair. He started chasing me and I ran all the way to the casinos. And what is interesting <laughs> is that the same day, I said, I'm going to practice. Because I didn't even have now a uh, bus fare to go back to California. I have no house in, in Las Vegas, but in California, I'm living in a homeless shelter. So I said, I have to turn a trick now so that I can get my bus fare back to California. So I remember that I went to, again, Paris Hotel in Las Vegas. And uh, there was a white guy there. And I said, excuse me, uh, can I sit next to you? I said, no problem at all. He was so drunk. <laughs> <laughs> He's, he had a tattoo called In Bob We Trust. 
Anyway, uh, Bob ended up promising me that uh, he's going to take me to New York and he's going to make me a movie star and A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. You can imagine all the lies. I went back to California and that is when I got arrested now. So I was a volunteer for Barack Obama campaign. Yeah, the very first campaign was 2008. But I used to um, not to want to anybody to know that the situation that I was in. You know, this called, thing called pride. We Luo people are so bad with something called pride. Uh, during Barack Obama campaign, I, I met a lot of people who could help me, but I was simply too proud to tell them what I was going through. I even saw Oprah Winfrey uh, at UCLA with Michelle Obama. I was volunteering, sometimes write people's names. Barack Obama used to hold a lot of fundraisings at Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in downtown LA. So I was always one of the volunteers writing the names down of the people coming. There would be musicians, Alicia Keys, Neo, so many of them. I even was hanging out with Snoop Dogg. Uh, very closely, but because these people are so high, I wanted to feel like I'm so high. They used to ask me, what do you do for a living? And I would be like, I'm a Kenyan uh, music producer. <laughs> you know, sometimes if you are in a situation, it's good to simply humble yourself and, and ask for help. So I was too proud to let anybody know that I'm suffering in a homeless shelter. I was coming from a homeless shelter, but I was lying to these people. I was lying to Snoop Dogg. I even had a conversation one on one with Snoop Dogg. And I was lying to Snoop Dogg that I'm, I'm a Kenyan film producer <laughs> and I'm a homeless girl, a homeless bitch in Los Angeles. <laughs> so that is one of my biggest regrets, you know. I met many opportunities, but I didn't utilize them or maximize them. I used to lie that I am somebody that I'm not. Because you don't want to say you are in America and, and you're going through something hard. Because people at home, they want you to send them money. So you want to keep up sending money, even if you are stripping naked, you know, to send people money. You just want to send people money. Even if you are uh, being used, being abused, even if you are doing pornography, even if you are doing whatever you have to do, uh, you are, we are lowering ourselves simply to maintain the image and for everybody to think that we are okay when you're not. Yeah. So if you are in America and, and you are going through a lot, you know, it's shameful to ask for people money at home. But sometimes you have to take care of yourself before you can take care of other people. So I would just urge you that even if you have a family that is in their need, you know, you grew up in Kenya, God has always taken care of them. Don't hurt yourself to help your family. Just try to help yourself first. Try to be stable first. I know how much you love your family. But just, just help yourself and then you can be in a better position to help people. And people at home should understand that if somebody is overseas and they are not helping you, probably they are not in a position to help you yet. Because there is nobody who would wish for their family to suffer if they are feeling well. So both sides need to understand. So I was arrested one day when I was coming from Obama campaign. And I found mail in my inbox. They have boxes with each room's name. The mail was from home, and I definitely knew it was a video of my father's funeral because my father had died when I was in the U.S., and I couldn't come to the funeral. I was now out of status. And so I asked my family to film a video for me of the burial. So when I got mail from home, I knew for a fact that it's my father's funeral, and I remember uh, knocking on the door of the homeless shelter staff and they were laughing. Um, this is what really hurt me the most. This is what made me do what I did. Because I, I found them watching a video of my father's funeral. And I said, excuse me, why are you doing this? And they started laughing and then they banged the door to my face. And when I said, excuse me, excuse me, open the door, give me my mail, they burst out laughing even louder. And their names are Elizabeth Olguins and Ken Kendra Shepard. Kendra Shepard is an African-American. Elizabeth Olguins is a Hispanic lady. So uh, the laughter is what irritated me. And I saw I took the charcoal lighter fluid and I poured it on the carpet. The reason why I poured this charcoal lighter fluid on the carpet was to get their attention, to get out and give me my mail. Because when I was banging the door, it was funny and they were laughing. They were laughing at my father being buried. 
So I didn't light the charcoal lighter fluid to kill people or to burn. I wanted to get their attention. You know, in African culture, fire was a form of communication. And so in my head and my mind, I wanted to communicate a message, get out and give me my, my mail. So they got out, they turned the fire off with a sweatshirt. I wish I brought my police reports. They have been brought to me in my Nairobi house. I have them now in the house in Nairobi. Uh, they turned the, the fire off with a hooded sweatshirt and I was arrested and taken to Los Angeles County Jail. Initially, I was taken for unlawfully causing a fire, which is punishable by six months in jail. When I went to court the first time, the charge was upgraded to us on 451B, which is willfully and maliciously starting a fire with intention to kill people. But because there was no evidence that my intention was to kill people, they added more false charges. They said, when she was lighting the fire, she said, I will burn this place down and kill you. And I said I didn't, because if I did, it would be in the, in the police report, it would be in the fire department report, it would be on the 911 call, it would be anywhere, but it wasn't. It just popped in court. So because I was alone in court, uh, no witnesses on my side, the charges stuck. And I want to point out that uh, the Kenyan embassy was a big letdown to me when I was in jail, because I would call, either they would not pick up, I would call, 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 they were not picking up. They were the only family I had in America. And I think these are some of the reasons why they have the embassies. I would call, 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 nobody would pick up. When they pick up, they would be like, excuse me, but uh, you are in jail? Okay, call us tomorrow. So um, after the Kenyan embassy refused to pick up my calls, they, they kept telling me to call the day or the, uh, the day after, and Friday and the likes, I wrote a letter to Honor Rebraila Odinga, and he received my letter, and uh, his sister came to visit me. His sister is named Akinyo Odinga, and uh, during the visit, she asked, how can she help me? And I said, uh, get me a lawyer. The lawyer I have is not helping me. But the day that she got me the lawyer that the lawyer was supposed to take over, the, I was accused of being mentally incompetent to stand trial. So uh, they said I'm crazy, and uh, they postponed the case for 90 days, and the lawyer never took over. And so I fought alone in the county jail for 18 months, going through so much abuse in the county jail, the police kicking me with their boots, uh, being stripped naked. And something I've never said before in any of the interviews is that it's always so humiliating in America, going to court and coming back. Every time you have to, you have to go to court, you have to strip, they, they strip you naked and you have to spread your vagina. Every single time you come from court again, you strip naked because there are people who are hiding drugs inside their private parts. So that is like something that is so humiliating, it's so humiliating because you have to do it in front of everybody, in front of the police. They have to search you. They even have a spotlight inside you. One of the most terrible experiences I ever went through. But after 18 months, uh, I was taken to trial and convicted of arson, 451B, criminal threats, count one, criminal threats, count two. And Judge Kathleen Kennedy sentenced me to uh, five years in prison. Many people are asking me, who is the lawyer who was letting you down? His name is Tracy Grayson. That's the African-American lawyer who just made a big mess out of my life. I served five years in prison, and the day of my release, I was taken again to immigration jail. Yeah, so on the day of my release, I was really happy. Everybody is always so happy, you know, to go back. I know I'm going to have a fresh start, but I know that I can do it because in the back of my mind, I really know I'm not a criminal. I really know that um, somebody pushed me to do what I did. Somebody violated my rights. So I know I'm not a criminal and I know that I can make it again and I want a second chance and I don't want to be deported with nothing. And I'm being told, put your hands behind your back and more chains again. I'm being taken to the county jail. And now I'm like, 
No way again. I've served five years. What's wrong? Can I just now be free? So, uh, at the county jail, I have to be my own lawyer because they don't give you a lawyer in the county jail. So I had to read their laws. I, I did try to defend myself. But uh, the immigration judge denied all my applications and ordered that I should be deported. I tried to appeal the decision. The appeal there was not even heard. So I said, I'm going to go on a hunger strike because I've tried to communicate with these people through all languages that I can. But there I wrote so many letters when I was incarcerated. I wrote so many letters to uh, the judges telling them, I didn't do this. Please just give me a chance. I'm sorry. I wrote so many letters to President Barack Obama in the White House. I don't know if he ever received any of them. I wrote so many letters to anybody who could listen to the judges, like nobody was listening to me. Nobody was giving me an ear. So I said, okay, let me go on a hunger strike so that I at least they can hear me. So I went on a hunger strike for two months. I didn't eat anything, not even water until they put uh, some things, solid food with pipes. They put some pipes on my nose and they were feeding me with my nose. And one day they just came and said, uh, are you gonna cooperate or are you taking you by force? And I just said, take me by force. And they pulled the things out of my nose and they threw me on a stretch. I was too weak to even walk, to even stand. I was really weak because I had not eaten for two months. And uh, just in the hospital gown, basically naked i was put in the aeroplane big military aeroplane <laughs> and um, i was deported to kenya with nothing no nothing so when you get to jomo Kenyatta international airport they were now embarrassed that uh, i was naked so they were trying to force me to wear jail clothes at the airport and i said no way so I started to scream at the very top of my lungs. I was screaming until the airport police, the Kenyan airport police came and told them, don't touch me anymore. They called the Red Cross people. The Red Cross people came and the Red Cross people really harassed the immigration officers until the immigration officers said it's the Kenyan embassy that gave them permission to deport me. So they were like, if it was this bad, why did the Kenyan people issue travel documents? Huh? We would have just let her out on the street, but the Kenyan embassy said we should uh, take her home because she has a family here at home. My fears about uh, returning to Kenya, because uh, that would have been a very good option when I got arrested, before serving my prison sentence, before serving the five years. If you knew you were going to get to deport me, deportation alone is enough punishment. Yeah, it's more than enough punishment. So my fear was like, how am I going home with nothing? to nothing. My mom is dead, my brother is dead, my father is dead. My sisters are just looking to me. My sister had to drop out of school at one point because I'm the one who was paying her school fees and I got arrested. Uh, I have nowhere to go to, basically. I have no money to start a business, I have nothing. So that was my biggest fear, you know, coming back to Kenya with nothing. Nobody wants to come back home with nothing. I was taken to Mata Hospital and um, my brother came. By the way, when he arrived, he thought I was dead. He was crying because I was covered with a white bed sheet all the way over my face. So my brother was crying and I just opened the bed sheet. I was very weak, but I was not dead, obviously. <laughs> I opened the bed sheet and I said, Ben, I'm not dead. I'm alive. So he stopped crying and I just told him to give me some fish. And after that I went to his house and um, I stayed with him for a while. And then I went to the village to stay with my oldest sister. And they just wanted me to go back and finish school. You know, I never finished university education. But I was like, um, I want my own income. I don't want to be a student now. You know, I'm, I'm approaching my 30s. So I just went to Mombasa to hustle. I went to start selling water on the streets, on Mamangina Street. And I would tell people, Mamangina, I used to be in America. People would be like, you're lying. No way. Because <laughs> in Mamangina, I didn't even have 10 shillings to buy a banana. I would just, I, my rent was, I was sharing 
a bed sitter for 800 shillings with somebody. But I couldn't even come up with the 400 shillings in a month to pay my share of the rent. I didn't even have food and I'm from America. I would even just admire a banana and I don't have 10 shillings to buy a banana. So I, I, I said that whatever happens, I have to happen. So I would give my ID, take some water and sell it all on the streets. And then I added groundnuts. So I would fry groundnuts and sell it on Mamangina. And uh, one day I posted my story online on Craigslist. Yeah, you remember Craigslist is an American website that is also in Kenya. And when I posted my story, several, several guys responded. It was, it's, I, I posted it like on a dating session. Many, many white people responded. And I responded to this one guy who was an uh, American in the country. And he said he was living at uh, Four Points Hotel on Hallingham. If I can go meet him there. So I went from Mombasa, where I was selling water, and I went to meet him. Okay, when I went to meet Ken, the first question he asked me was, why were you arrested? Because in the story, I didn't indicate why I was arrested. And I just told him I was arrested for arson. And he said, if you had lied to me, you would have gone back to Mombasa right now. He said, I'm a police officer in the U.S. And I said, if you're a police officer in the U.S., then why do you want me, you know? I'm a terrorist in your country. Why do you want to even meet me? And Ken said that um, I've been a police officer for over 20 years and I've read everything that was in your court reports. And I wanted to meet you because I know those things are not necessarily true. I know how we write reports. And I know that you're not who they are saying you are. So that's why I wanted to meet you because I know everything there is not true because I have written similar reports for people. I know how we treat black people in my country. So Ken is the one who started to change my life a little bit. He rented for me a house, he opened for me a small place, a small restaurant in Dagoreti Corner. And um, it's when my life started to change a little bit. And then, uh, Ken went back to his country and he died, heart attack. <laughs> so I was back again to zero. After Ken died, you know, the, the, the white guy who was now supporting me, I got very desperate, you know. And I met a bouncer in a club, the one, the father of my babies. I was now so desperate, like, because I tried to have a baby with Ken, but it didn't happen. And, um, I started dating him just out of desperation. And I know I'm saying sharing this because many people ask me, where are you? Where is your children's father? You know? And um, many, many women fall into this trap when you are desperate to just anybody that comes. So uh, my children's father was a bouncer. After as soon as he met me, he stopped working. He just now wanted to depend on me and wanted to control me and beat me. And I was like, no. So I said, I'm going to be a single mom and I'm going to raise my kids. Whether you are here or you're not there. And maybe somebody's going to tell him, whatever. But uh, he's tried to come back, by the way, since I got to the limelight. Now saying, I want to see my kids that you have never even sent 10 shillings to. So there is no chance at all that... <laughs> <laughs> that we'll get back together. And if you are a woman there, you are vulnerable maybe. Just because you have kids, that doesn't mean that your life is over. You can still start afresh. You can still raise your kids, you know. If you are married and you're happy, I'm very happy for you, you know. But if it doesn't work out, like for me, it didn't work out, just pick up yourself and do whatever it takes. You know, God, if you have kids, God cannot let you suffer with the kids. You will never sleep hungry. You will never go on the streets. So um, as I conclude this story, the biggest lesson I've learned is uh, as long as you're breathing, as long as you're still alive, something, there's something that maybe, some, some mission that you have to accomplish. I honestly never knew that I would be the one who lived to tell my own story. 
I honestly believed I would die in America. Even in my head, I would plan my funeral. I would see my body uh, being uh, transported home. I would see the politicians now talking about my story as if they care. By the way, no politician has reached out to me, you know. No known figure, so I'm not for... I'm not endorsing any politician at all. But um, I would actually imagine my funeral. And I would imagine people saying my story and people lying, maybe I'm a criminal. So it's even a miracle that uh, I'm alive and I'm here to tell my own story. People ask me, why are you happy? I'm happy because I, I never in my wildest dreams thought I would tell my story. I honestly thought somebody else would be telling my story. So if you are still alive and no matter what you are going through, please just don't give up. Yeah. Just don't give up because if God has still given you life, if you are still breathing, maybe God has a plan. Things may seem dark like it's the end of life, but if you are still alive, don't take your life, you know, don't kill yourself. Uh, just get up and start again because God has a plan for you. And thanks to many, many Kenyans, by the way. Uh, through Jalango, many Kenyans contrib contributed money to me and I have been able to open a restaurant. <laughs> so I want to welcome you, you know, to come to Motherland. You know, I, I named Motherland because Motherland is Africa. I hope that it can be a place of solace for everybody, whether you are big or small. Uh, I still have a long way to go. But I know that uh, everything will be okay. And there are people who have been supporting you. If you still want to support me, yeah, feel free. Uh, I, I still want to pay the restaurant rent for at least six months because uh, I still need more furniture. If you want to donate for me furniture for the restaurant, I still need quite a few things. But I'm really thankful to God and to many Kenyans who have already stepped up and I have reached this far. Actually, I never believed, and I, I took a while to share my story because I knew nobody would believe me. Yeah, you know, because people would just be like, you went to America, that's your own fault. You lost the opportunity. And I'm sure people would have judged me. I think what changed everything is the George Floyd story. When he was killed, people changed their perspective about America. Now people are listening. I'm just really happy. I'm happy for the support I'm receiving from many Kenyans. But people are thinking like I'm a millionaire now. No, not yet. <laughs> let's keep praying by God's grace that I will get there. And uh, let's keep praying for an endorsement too. You know, if you're a company uh, and you want me to endorse your product, please talk to me because you know what? I released a music video and in two days I have 30,000 views. This is just natural views with no advertisement. I have not paid anybody any money to watch it. So you can find me uh, online on my Instagram is Mercy Music, music with a K. My Facebook page is also Mercy Music with a K. My YouTube, if you just type Mercy Artist or if you just type I don't wanna know. <laughs> right now you can know it's my channel because I have about 21,000 subscribers. Okay, I have to, I can't get out before I sing a song. <laughs> the new song stays like this. People always gonna talk about you every day. I know it hurts. I know you're a human being. It's easier said than done. But baby, let it fly. 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 fly. Uh-huh.